We must stand firm and use our influence with the Word of God in a day when our culture is set against us. While Seth and Nerva Reddy began their journeys in different musical circles, Nerva with Toby Mack and Seth with Kirk Franklin, it wasn't long before their paths began to cross. Since then, the beloved husband and wife have been on a mission with their new music, One Voice, to call us back to a unity founded in Christ. Instead of the divisions our society is experiencing, they hope to point people in the only direction where real solutions can be found, the way of Christ. This is their story. This is Today's Nashville. This is Faith. Seth and Nerva, I am so excited that you have joined me on Today's Nashville. I've been wanting you for a long time. Welcome. Thank you, Terry. It's good yeah, to be here. Yeah, thanks so much for having us. You guys have been busy, haven't you? We've been doing life. It's been good. Yep. Won't complain. Full, rich, but yeah. It's been good, good times. Well, tell me how it all started. You have both had music careers, different music careers, and I love how God crossed your paths. Yeah. So we, let's talk about that. Well, we sort of met doing um, background vocals. We kind of made careers out of singing background vocals for professional Christian artists. And who so were I they? was with Toby Mac, and he was with Kirk Franklin, and we met backstage at a Billy Graham crusade. So that's when yeah. we came oh, that's one wonderful. of his last ones. Yeah. Well, what was it like touring? You were with Toby Mack, what, eight years? Oh, a long much time. longer time than that, 17 years 17 total. 17 years. Yes. And I'm not gonna lie, it was a blast. It was so much fun. Something that I dreamt of, but I didn't have enough sense to pray for that specific kind of prayer. And God just blessed me with it. We traveled the country and parts of the well, world. How did you even meet him? You're from Chicago, yes. right? Mm -hmm. Grew up in Chicago and then went to college in Nashville. Stayed there for years, just in the music scene, just waiting for God to open doors. But I was traveling home from, I think, North Carolina one weekend. And before, before the flight took off, I got up and moved to a window seat and it was Toby Mac's seat. And I, I, didn't, I was familiar with DC Talk at the time, but I never met Toby. His singer had just quit that very weekend and was looking for someone to fill the spot. And there I was, and I auditioned and got the gig. And I was so, so you sat right next to him. I no, sat she, she in stole his seat. seat. I stole his seat. Stole yeah. Seat. <laughs> and and went back to my original seat after he walked up. But later on, a manager introduced us. And um, so, how yeah. did he even know you were a singer then? You know, there was a team I was traveling with, and he, his manager must have had a conversation on the flight with one of our, our team. I was traveling with Joyce Meyer Ministry at the oh, time. Yeah. Yeah. Somehow I was introduced to him on the flight, and uh, that's when the manager said, Yeah, we're looking for a singer. Would you be interested in auditioning? I was like, Sure, I'll check out this Toby Mac guy. I'm not sure, but I'll look into it. And You did know who he was, though, right? Or I, didn't know specifically. I knew DC Talk, but mm -hmm. I had never met him individually. So I, I got to know who he was a little bit after that. So I'm so yeah, blessed. She, she didn't yeah. grow up like no, huge CCM. I wasn't as atmosphere. huge. More gospel music, not necessarily CCM. So she said the first. Actually, I'm sorry. Yeah, go ahead. Look. She said the first time she jumped, like got on stage with him, it was Atlanta oh, yes. Fest when it was huge, and she was like, "Who is this guy?" Yeah, I was like, "Wow, this guy what is, is a big deal. Here? He's a big deal." So, yeah, it's really funny that I got the gig because I. Um, uh, he was taking a chance on me. I hadn't done a ton of music. I'd done a lot of background singing in the studio, but he was just so gracious and walking me through and helping me to just learn the ropes of how of tour life and travel, and it was just a blast. So you were here in Nashville for 18 years? Oh, uh, let's see. Yes, uh, 18 plus years. And, traveling yeah, the world. Traveling the world. And you, at the yeah. same time, were with Kirk. Franklin. Yeah, probably just a little like? bit after she started. It was it was crazy. Like I was I lived middle of nowhere, didn't know anybody. Where in the are you from? Uh, Central Florida, a little town okay. called Auburndale. And uh, Chicago, Florida. Yeah, yeah man. Just yeah, you know, man, match made in heaven. <laughs> 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 but yeah, I was in Central Florida. I was I was actually in college. I was a math major, just but I loved music and I recorded a demo with a guy and it got passed to a guy who passed it to Kurt Franklin. And he needed a guy like last minute for a tour. And I was a huge gospel music fan, huge Kirk Franklin fan. So when I got the call to travel, I was like, 
I got to do this. So I left after my junior year in just a junior year in college. Yeah, in college, and went to Dallas, lived with the, with Tony Evans' family for a couple months while I uh, rehearsed for the tour. And then it was like a whole new life started. Now, how long were you with him? About three or four years. Three or four years. Mm-hmm. And from him, I met other gospel artists and started traveling with them. So it was kind of a just a, a huge door opener for me. Okay, the big question is how did you all meet through all this? Yeah, so there's some discrepancies in the story, but I'll, I'll give you the true version. <laughs> and then I want to hear yours. <laughs> She'll give you the, the apocryphal version. But um, yeah, so basically we, she, she said we met yeah, quickly we at Billy Graham Crusade backstage. Um, she doesn't remember meeting me there. We met again sure. at uh, House of Blues when her, uh, Toby and Kurt de- did a tour Orlando. together that I didn't go on. And I met her backstage. She doesn't re- remember meeting me there either. I don't. Um, but that's when it started for me. I was like, you know, I got the googly eyes on that, that time meeting her. So sometimes I say love at second sight for me and love at 554 sight yeah. for her. <laughs> Um, but, I, but I wore her down. We became friends. Uh, we, we started getting hired to sing together background vocals in Nashville and stuff. And so. Uh, we became friends, and yeah, I just I, I, I passed through the friend zone. She stiff armed me for a while, but <laughs> I made it through. Made it yes. through, and uh, finally, we started uh, kind of dating. It was a quick dating, quick you know engagement. Right. Seven yeah. months, we got married, and True. you know when we first married, we were kind of doing um, tour life apart, and we prayed that God would kind of allow us to work more to, more so together, and that began to happen. Mm-hmm. I, I think we. Um, moved to Florida from Nashville and he had taken a position at his alma mater, Southeastern University, as a director of worship. We started working with the children there on some music. Um, children, students. They students, were like, yeah, they were like children. Like children. <laughs> they were like children. <laughs> no, <they> were <laughs> and so um, after that, um, we moved on and do, to do some young adult ministry. Yeah. And then we were contacted by Integrity Music to um, do a project with them, to sign with them, and that was a blessing, a dream yeah. come true. And from there, we started doing a ministry together. And we had moved yeah. to Florida. We were living in Florida Still at that time. Florida and at the time. yeah, they m- met us in Florida, talked with us a little bit, and we did a, a project with Integrity Music. And that yeah. began to open doors for us to travel more so together and so yeah a lot of times you start we were in Nashville for a while but we didn't do music together when we were in Nashville it's kind of after we left that God began to open those doors which is kind of unique but yeah we were based out of Florida and and we did young adult ministry there for like three years and that just became part of the overall thing that we felt like God was doing was was shaping us and shaping our music in a different way and kind of giving us a specific mission with it that we probably wouldn't have had had we not gone through that whole process That's of true. working at a university in a, in a young adult ministry, so. Yeah, he began, God began to crystallize the passion behind the music or just the, we noticed that working with the college students that they had certain questions, certain fears, certain things that they were dealing with. And that became one of the focuses of our message is just helping um, young people and Christians at large just develop a Christian understanding of things that they were walking through, things mm-hmm. they were facing in life, things that they might have seen in culture. And that's a, a passion that Seth has always had too, because he's his testimony he'll share. Just sometimes life hits and the enemy wants to come in and try to interpret those events. Mm. And that may cause you to kind of rethink your Christian faith, but this, we all need guides to help us, to help us just point us into the right, the right direction to find some answers. And so God was birthing some of those things in us and um, developing a heart for ministry and alongside the music, which was kind of worship focused at the time. So. Before we talk about what God is doing in your life, in your ministry, Seth, Nerva, I would love to hear how you met Jesus, your testimony. Yeah, for me, you know, I I did thankfully grow up in a Christian home. I had, you know, parents, not perfect, but very um, dedicated to their walk with the Lord, and they they raised me up in that way. And so um, at the age of six, I think it was an Awana's meeting or something, I raised my hand to get saved, you know. And I really did have, like, even at a young age, I had a desire to follow the Lord. I mean, I was a normal knuckleheaded kid like the rest, but um, had a desire to follow the Lord. And he, you know, walked with him. When I got in youth group, probably about 15, that was the, I really got serious about my faith. I had a great youth pastor who became a best friend eventually. But about that same time when I got serious, I began to be plagued by intellectual doubts. And 
you know, I think I remember just having, you know, the basic questions that you have, like, how do I know Christianity is true? What if I was born in a Muslim country? Would I be Muslim? You know, those kinds of basic things. Um, unfortunately, at the time, while my church background was great, it wasn't as equipped in that area. And I think it was before, like, people really knew the effects that public school could have on you. We, we tended to think it was just neutral. You know, they're teaching math, science, English, and that's worldviewishly neutral. Um, but it really wasn't. You know, it, was, it, was, it had secular presuppositions running through it that were forming my mind all the time, often without me even knowing it. And one example I give is, you know, the idea that the only, the only way you can know things is through science. It's, a, it's an epistemological view called scientism. And I didn't realize I was being taught that in my biology classes, that you know, they would say things like, well, religious people you know, used to believe this about the Earth's beginnings, but now we know through science. So it, it, it put this dichotomy in my mind between, well, we have faith in Christianity, but we have knowledge in science. So that, those kinds of things set me on a trajectory of really wrestling with the faith for like 15 years, even into our marriage where I was in ministry and I loved the Lord and I wanted to believe it, but there were times I was like, man, I don't know if this is true. I don't know that I can believe it anymore. And I was reading and reading and, you know, I'd read a book and I'd be confident for a minute, but then another thought would come and I had to read another book. I'd listen to another lecture. And, but anyways, to make a long story short, looking back on that time, that was really what God used in many dark nights of the soul and times I thought, you know, I don't, I don't think I have much faith left. I'm hanging by a thread here. But he, it was like he would give me the right person at the right time to come in my life, the right mentor, the right book. And as long as I kept going in that direction, as hard as it was, he would meet me there. And looking back, like when we began to do young adult ministry, I can see how purposeful it was. That even though it was a painful process, he brought me to a place where I could confidently say Christianity is something that can not only, it, it's not only that we believe it to be true, we can know it to be true, we can have our confidence in it. And actually when it comes to reason and logic, and I, I've done, a, I mean, hours and hours and hours of studying all sorts of different worldviews and religions, and it is the one perspective that I think is the most intellectually satisfying and stands on the, the shoulders of giants. And, and at this point, I'm thankful for that process, having gone through that as tough as it was. I can say, man, I really know who has called me, and he's been there with me. I've, I've experienced him. And it's like C.S. Lewis said, I know Christianity is true not only because I see it, but like the sun, by it I see everything. It makes sense of everything we experience in life. And so that's my little, my little yeah. testimony. What about you, Nerva? How did that, you, you, with your testimony and your faith and how that kind yeah. of was in your marriage and how did that yeah I, I, I could say that um you know Seth has challenged me over the years not to just know what I believe but how and why I believe it and so my testimony is a little bit more I didn't grow up in a Christian home but um south side of Chicago was tough so growing up in that environment was just um challenging as a young person mm. going off to college I got born again I found the Lord a friend walked me into a relationship with Jesus, but from there, just just struggling to still find meaning and purpose. So it's the process of discipleship. And I finally landed at a church that, that brought that into my life to smooth out all of my rough edges. By that point, I might've developed a habit of finding meaning in the wrong places through relationships, through performing and singing. And then that just was a cycle of defeat that God began to just re-transform my mind mm -hmm. in understanding why I'm here and what, what's my purpose in life. Well, tell me too how your music came together and how old were you both when you mm -hmm. started your music careers? Were you young or? Oh gosh, I was in, let's see, Maybe I started singing along to the radio as a child, but in, in high school, I joined the choirs and do the local talent shows. And then when I went off to college in Nashville, Tennessee, a school called Fisk University, I majored in music. And so slowly but surely after that, God began to open doors. So I would say that process from my teens up until now of just pursuing music, wanting to make a career. Back then, I didn't know you could actually make a career out of music. You dream about being the next so-and-so, but God's been so faithful and so good. What about you, Sam? Yeah, I mean, uh, sometimes I tell these students that we work with, like, man, when, when we were young, <laughs> yeah. YouTube didn't exist. Yeah. You know? There was no TikTok. There was, we, American in Idol. fact, American Idol wasn't yeah. around. So it's like, you didn't know that you could do this back then. It was like, even when I talked to my dad about doing music, he was like, well, you better do something you can get a job in, boy, you know? Yeah, and yeah. He, there's wisdom to that. Like, so I majored in math instead of music. 
because I didn't think there was a potential for that. You know, somehow it was one of those really supernatural um, movements of God where you just, you can't explain it. It was nothing I did. It was not my genius or nothing I put out there, but he just opened that door with Kurt. So I, I really went, literally went from zero to like a world traveling, world stage kind of thing, meeting my heroes. And so it, it was just that crazy. And then so when I met when I met her, by that point, I had learned a lot from these guys. We, we both learned a lot from the best, you know, just sitting behind them, mm-hmm. watching them do it, sure. watching them create in the studio, watching them come up with live shows. So when we began to do stuff together, it wasn't that much of a stretch for us. It was kind of just in us, you know? So yeah. we're like, man, I, I guess we did learn some of this for stuff sure. over time, whether it's... It's a lot harder on your own. A lot <laughs> but, harder. But yeah. richer, Yeah, too. yeah. We said we went from the cruise ship yeah, to the too. canoe, you right. know, hitting that hard <laughs> That's paddle. true, the, the, the difference in the and so that, that was so, yeah. that was it. And then you have to, you, you, you know, you want to do what is uniquely put in you as sure. well, like what God puts in you. So sure. we do have our own, you know, our own journeys and what God has put in us and brought in us. Kirk has his thing, Toby has yeah. his thing. But for us, it was like, man, we feel like part of our thing is to, is to push back the darkness and use our music as a tool and a weapon to do that and really um, just make some stances and, and kind of, you know, whether it's worship music or just like current music, mm-hmm. to, to do our best to take that into these kind of spaces and use it for the message. And your message is unity. Mm-hmm. And I love that. And we're going to talk about that when we get back. You were talking about how your music has come together and how God is using you in your ministry. And would you sing, you know, part of a song for me? Okay, so this song is called Armor, and the verse goes, When the playground becomes a battleground, draw strength. Every soldier takes up weapons in war. You'll be able to stop the fiery darts that come. Put on the whole armor. Draw straight from your father. You'll find you'll be stronger. When you put on the whole armor of God. It's beautiful. It's beautiful. And this is a new project you're working on. Yes. It's out. It's called On Earth. And it comes from the prayer where the scripture says, let your kingdom come, let your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And Mm -hmm. it's just a collection of songs that God had kind of birthed in us during, um, it started during the pandemic. Some things that we were praying about, that we were Mm -hmm. seeing out in culture. And we were like, you know, um, messages we were hearing that God wanted to do in the earth. And we would just kind of come up with songs from that place. Yeah. What do you think about what's going on in the inner Ooh. culture? Yes. Let's talk about it. Yeah. <laughs> wow, that's, that's a, that's Where do a we thing start? right there. <laughs> that's a good question. You know, we, so coming from like the journey that I took in my own faith, it really, I thank God, like he taught me how to be a thinker. Mm. Like it was, it, was my, it was my pursuit of the kingdom mm. that made me learn about words and ideologies. So I feel like in a way he gave me a head start where I wasn't looking for it. But when all the craziness began to go on, um, he so, it was sort of like he had already given me equipment to see through it. And so part of it is like you would see some of the stuff happening and people would respond. And um, I began to, to see, to look past that and say, oh, man, who is concocting these narratives? Like, and what is, the, what is the purpose behind it? So I think, you know, I'll try to make this, this really long thing really short, but we began to see this thing called woke ideology come through. Now I had studied postmodernism, but I hadn't, I hadn't seen how it was being utilized to pick up on past racial injustices to bring about a narrative that was actually false in the present. And so once I began to read some of the books by some of these thinkers, I was like, oh man, he's, he's actually, he's using truth differently here. He's using knowledge. He's redefining racism. He's redefining white supremacy, all this kind of stuff. So. We, as, we, as our eyes began to be open to these tactics, when something major would come along and the news would start interpreting it, I was, we, we saw where the falsehoods were. 
So you had to kind of like, you had, you had to like practice biblical discernment to say, what, is, what does the Bible have to say about these issues? And then who can I trust to tell me what's actually going on? So if you're talking about just the big picture of culture, you like, I, I think the biggest thing, we've tried to do this in podcasts too. Tell me, tell me the name of your podcast. Yeah, it's called the Free, Free Mind, Mind Podcast. Free Mind podcast. Yeah, we touch we, and we hit stuff, you know, head on. So we try to ask, like, man, who is telling the story? And what is their motivation? What, are, what, are, what is the evidence they're presenting for that? How do we as Christians yeah. think through this more clearly and carefully? And that's why we wanted to write that music in that as well, because, like, Christianity isn't to be pushed to the side um, in this kind of, like, marginal place. It's, it's Christ is king. Like, he's Lord over everything. So when, when you're talking about whether it's the area of legality and laws, justice, what is the nature of justice, or what is education, all these things, like Christ is king over those things. He's not outside of that. And so we try to do our best to say, okay, what does he have to say about these issues and how do we respond on that basis? Anything you'd add to that, babe? Yeah, and to, to encourage those that do find the truth to be a signpost for others, you know, because the thing that's heartbreaking is to see when your fellow um, family members or church members or pastors fall prey to the false ideologies because it's very popular, it it's, very it's prevalent, popular. it's, it's ubiquitous, it's everywhere, but it's not really truth you know, or it's not biblical, but yet it's seeping into the church. And then you feel like yeah. it's, they call it virtue signaling, signaling where you just do it because it's from culture's eyes, the right thing to do, but it's antithetical to the scripture. So it, it, like he said, it takes discernment. It takes a little bit of knowledge of history, a little bit of knowledge of, okay, what what is popular? Why, did, like he said, how did this come about? Who is facilitating and pushing these things? So we've gotta be a little bit more sharper than I think. Um, it's amazing what yeah. is going on in yeah. our It's culture. quite crazy. It is bananas. crazy. Yeah. And I, can I add one thing to yes. it is what yeah. I would say, you know, it's it's been a rough time. It's been painful for a lot of people and it's caused a lot of breaking of relationships within families, within churches mm -hmm. and everything. I think part of that we have to go through yeah. because whenever, you know, I don't know if you've ever seen a situation where you find out something that's been going on for years, it's really unhealthy and really bad. Like you can't paper over that. You have to like go through it to the other side to get healing. And so I think one of the things we're seeing in culture now is not so much that it's new stuff, but it's an exposing of stuff that's been going yeah, that's on for true. years and then a bit of an acceleration on top of it. And so in a way, I'm actually encouraged by it at times because it's like, okay, well, now we're at least seeing what's there. And that fact makes me think, okay, God is, is taking us through this painful thing so that he can wake us up because for too long, many of us have been asleep to the enemy's tactics. And we've been lulled like the, you know, the proverbial frog in the pot. And so now it's like they, they turned up the heat a little bit, right? So we're hopping out. Yeah. It's painful, but it's a good thing. What do you say to uh, a Christian who has kind of stepped away and they're kind of, you, you know, questioning yeah. like, like you were, or, um, like you said, having some of those woke mm -hmm. thoughts in their mind and, you know, you guys aren't quite right. What do you say to them? You know, as, as an older brother to some of our, our, the younger students we talked to, I'm like, man, I promise you, I've, I've seen it. I've been out there. The Christian worldview stands on the, firm, the most firm foundation of any worldview. Don't be so arrogant to presume that you've discovered the thing that the people over thousands of years haven't, first of all. But also, like, be humble enough to, to find people that can help you. That was what helped me out. The, the main thing was finding good mentors that were gifted in those areas that I could bounce stuff off of. And oftentimes, I'd have a 40-minute session with a guy, and he'd say, and now read these six books, and I'll... And I'll talk to you next month. And I had to do the work. Like you have to, you, if you're going to really pursue truth, Dallas Willard, you said this, you know, the, the multiplication tables aren't going to knock you down when you're walking down the street. You have to sit down and you have to study oh, them. Good. So if you're going to be a person who cares about knowledge, cares about truth, you have to pursue it, but pursue it in a safe place, not out there doing the, the lone warrior on Google, you know, but get with some good people that you trust. You see the fruit in their lives because there's a difference between intelligence and wisdom. Wisdom bears good fruit for life. You can be an intelligent person and be a wreck. And you can, you can be an intelligent person and not know truth in a broad sense. 
So I say find people that are wise, that bear fruit, and get up under them and study them. The Bible stands up to scrutiny. And when it comes to all those things, you can learn all the details, but you really don't know the counterfeit outside of studying the real. So make sure you understand the real, and then it'll be easier to see through the other stuff as well. That's where I'd start. The Word of God, right? Amen. Yeah. Good old fashioned. Yes. You know? <laughs> and it's hard. Like, there is a part where you have to, it takes time to sit down and even understand what is this Bible I'm holding? What, is, right. what are these That's genres awesome. of literature? Like, how do I even understand this stuff? But, you know, we'll put a lot of time into learning something on YouTube and other areas. Exactly. That's true. And how, so well, good. Really, right. Yeah, all this and other it, stuff. You know, we have other Bibles, but when yeah. it comes to the Bible, will we, will we be the kind of people who will pursue it and seek the kingdom first? And that, that is the thing. Like, through all the struggles, all the difficulty, I've seen it true that if you seek the kingdom first, he will find you. Oh, oh Seth, Nerva. Thank you so much. What a blessing you are to so many people. Thank you, Terry. Thanks so well, thanks much for so having much. us. Thanks so much. We appreciate you just taking the time to chat with us. My friend, do you need truth in your life? Do you need Jesus? Don't look to the right. Don't look to the left. Look straight ahead. He's waiting right there in front of you. This is Today's Nashville. This is Faith. Stone Television wishes to thank all our faithful viewers whose consistent prayers and financial support have made this program possible.